find this platform also interesting in the fact that, you know, the, the Zoom. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Lamont, and welcome to NYO Canada Online Workshops. Our YouTube live chat is open, and we will be fielding questions throughout the workshop. So please feel free to post any comments, uh, questions, and of course, chat amongst each other. Today's presenter is a renowned artist manager representing the likes of Philip Chu, the Griffin Trio, and Jonathan Crow, who we luckily have with us today. As well, he is a graduate lecturer at both the Glenn Gould School and the University of Toronto. Please welcome Andrew Kwan. Thank you. Thank you, NYOC. Thank you, Chris, for the uh, for these past few weeks of, of hosting this wonderful opportunity. And today, I'm very fortunate to have esteemed uh, orchestral member of the Canadian Cultural Fabric, Concert Master of the Toronto Symphony, Mr. Jonathan Crow, who I am very fortunate to get to work with uh, on many occasions throughout the years through his various capacity. Uh, Jonathan, welcome. It's uh, hopefully you've been on one of these StreamYard uh, platforms. It's, uh, it's a little strange, especially when you watch it in the archives because you and I see each other and we don't really see who else is in the room. Right. So, uh, welcome. Thank you. And Thank I you. Thank you. You just came off yet another uh, virtual performance, was it, today? For yeah, it's my life now. Zoom meetings and kind of compilation videos. <laughs> well, that's great um, in that uh, this will lead us into some of the questions that we have. Um, Let's let's. I'm not sure how many people are watching us right now, and and I'm sure more than the few that have written in the live comments. Uh, but perhaps some people don't really know. They know you in title. They know you in your position, and they don't really know who or where you're from. So, can you share a little bit about uh, where you're from and where yeah. did you study? Absolutely. Um, I grew up in Prince George, BC, which is basically dead center British Columbia. Um, it's not a super small town. It was about 75,000 people when I lived there, but it is a long way from anything that's more major. It's about 10 hours drive from either Vancouver, Calgary, or Edmonton. And my parents are from Oxford and London, England. So as you can imagine, Prince George was a little bit of a culture shock for them. You know, they're going from like the cultural capitals of Europe to like this amazing town, but certainly it's, you know, an, an industry town, pulp, forestry, that sort of thing. This is before there was a university there. Um, and I think they felt a little bit kind of left out and didn't know how to get to know people. And the school district started a free Suzuki program. And this is amazing, right? Education in schools, it was free. Anybody that wanted to learn an instrument could. My parents were like, this is great. They threw me, my brother, my sister in, chance to meet like-minded people. I wanted to play the cello, but I had an older brother and older sister and we had a Volkswagen Rabbit. So uh, there's no way a cello was gonna fit in the car. So violin it was. Um, and I had fantastic teachers my entire life. You know, I didn't necessarily have one teacher for a long period of time, but Prince George was the kind of place where a lot of people would kind of graduate university or go there just to get set up. You know, this would be maybe their first job and they'd, they'd play with the symphony, they'd inherit a teaching studio there um, and get some experience. And it meant that I always had teachers that were super into it, that were super gung-ho to, to really enjoy working with young kids and to build up a studio and and to make you know in a way to establish themselves in the in the profession 
Um, so that was fantastic. When I was 15, my parents decided they were kind of thinking about retirement and being British, they retired as close to home as they could. So that was Victoria, BC, which is as English as you can get outside of actually being in the UK. <clears throat> So I studied there for another three years with a guy named Sidney Humphreys, who was amazing. He's, you know, he was at he was the opposite of my previous teachers. He was at the tail end of his career and had had a huge touring career in England, had worked as a Yehudi Menuhin's concert master in the Bass Festival Orchestra, toured the world in the quartet, and like really had done everything. Um, so that was a little bit different. That was going from learning from people that were amazing teachers, but in a way were, were learning along with me to somebody who had done everything in his career, had played all the major concertos with big orchestras, had worked with all the world's great conductors, and just had this experience of like, okay, well, this is what it's like. If you're playing this concerto, yeah, when you get here, this is what the conductor is gonna wanna do, or this is what the orchestra is gonna do. Um, and that was new for me, and that was fantastic, just to have, you know, really to learn from the experience. Um, from there, I went to school at uh, McGill University, now the Schulich School of Music. Um, and that was great, fantastic teacher. Mm -hmm. The Montreal Symphony, of course, has a huge connection and going from Prince George and Victoria to a town like Montreal with a world-renowned orchestra was incredible. The school is five minutes walk from Place des Arts. I got to see the world's great soloists and conductors come through. And that really inspired me. So I actually went straight from school there. I finished my bachelor degree and joined the Montreal Symphony. Um, very young when I started, I think I won the audition at the age of 19 for associate principal second violin and joined when I was 20. Um, and it was a great way to join an orchestra. You know, I was, a, I was a young kid. I obviously had no idea what I didn't know at that point, but I'm realizing now that it was a lot that I didn't know. But to join in the front of the seconds, but not in a position where I had to kind of jump in and tell people what to do. I was not concert master and didn't have to immediately tell people that had played a piece a hundred times what Boeing they should be playing in it. They all knew. Um, but also I was near the front. So when Martha, when Martha Argrich came through, when Zubin Mehta came through, I was right by them, right? A lot. And I could learn so much from having these great artists come through and getting to work with them really close up. Um, I won an audition from associate concert master there, which I did for three years and then was concert master of the Montreal Symphony before leaving that to start teaching at the Schulich School of Music. Um, I was uh, teaching at McGill for six years before coming to Toronto, where I've been for nine, and now concertmaster of Toronto Symphony and teaching at the University of Toronto and doing a bit of teaching with the Taylor Academy at the, at the Royal Conservatory and running a festival called Toronto Summer Music. Wow. And this is now. <laughs> <laughs> All that accumulated into, into a little virtual, uh, virtual uh, talk here. That's that's amazing. Well, thank you. That that's quite a journey from Prince George to Toronto. Um, did you ever consider the solo career? It's it's interesting that you won the audition uh, for uh, at such an early age. But yeah, it, I mean, it's a great question. I had I'd never planned that I would not go back to school when I won the audition. It was one of those things where I had no pressure. I was doing an audition because I thought, well. I have to learn what it's like and it's a really useful experience and again the audition is five minutes from my school why not take this chance to learn some repertoire to feel what the audition process is going to be like but i didn't have a mortgage writing on it i didn't have the there was not the pressure that oh my gosh if i don't get this job i won't be able to take care of my family and i would say it was a huge advantage for me to be able to take this audition and not feel the stress about what am i going to do if not um, but I would say that I was always planning to go back to school at some point and maybe do other things. And I was really lucky because my conductor at the time, Charles Dutois, he really supported people in the orchestra doing things in the outside. He thought it was really important that people in the orchestra, one, kept their playing up by doing solo and chamber music, but also that they just found things on the outside of orchestra that were fulfilling for them in addition. He thought he'd like to have people that would sound great in an orchestra but be happy to be there because it wasn't the only thing that they were doing. So I was lucky enough to have the chance to do lots of solo stuff on the outside. The orchestra was incredibly supportive of me giving me solo engagements. I think I joined the orchestra in September and in October I played Tchaikovsky Concerto with them on a full masterwork series with like three performances, right? Which is a pretty unusual thing for an orchestra to be like, okay, here's this new guy, we've barely heard you, but good luck, get up on stage and you get to play one of the major concertos for you know, full halls 
and that was incredible. And they all the entire time I was there, they gave me tons of opportunities and and really were supportive of everything else that I was doing in addition to the orchestra stuff. Well, that's very fortunate. Um, had you thoughts of uh, American orchestras? Like it, it I, I didn't realize that the, your dates were so in synced with with yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd always looked at American orchestras and I kind of considered some, but I, I always had such a great situation that it was a hard thing to kind of think about leaving. You know, the symphony was great to me. And when I left, McGill University was great to me. I never felt, I mean, I've always been in Canada. I was born here. I studied here. I never even really studied in the States for any part of time, for any length of time. And I consider myself very Canadian. And now that I have kids, you know, of course it comes into it. Where do I want to raise my children? Who do I want them to be when they grow up? Um, I'm very proud of living in Toronto, of being Canadian. And I love the things that my daughters get to do here. I love the vibe of the city. I love the kind of people that they will be growing up in Toronto. Um, it's, it's just, it's a very different society. And I think there's a lot to offer here in Canada. Absolutely. I often people ask uh, with my career, with my choices of artists, why do I not expand and sign on European artists and, and American artists? And this is the country that gave me the opportunities I've had yeah. education, business, uh, you know, funding support. Why would I not focus on that aspect? And, and yeah, absolutely. Um, you you sort of brought up. Uh, an interesting point that's in, in our script is a little bit later. Uh, you, you said Montreal Symphony offered you opportunities to to pursue other activities and, and other artistic ventures. Um, there's a bit of an age difference between the two of us. I definitely remember orchestras who were very uh, possessive about their players and yeah. basically the ability to uh, I realize the role of concertmaster offers you more flexibility, not more flexibility, but more opportunities to do um, do activities throughout the year uh, because of your responsibility, artistic responsibility. But how important is that? And, and I know having taught at the various institutions that I do teach at, often young emerging orchestral students, uh, primarily, you know, uh, the brass instruments, the woodwinds, where, you know, there's not a lot of uh, solo recitals for yeah. um, bone. Um They often feel these type of conversations are, are it, it doesn't affect them. So how important in your life, in your career today, back when you first started, um, is was to, to continue activities outside of the orchestra? And I think... For me, it was always, everything was always equal. And it, it's, in a strange way, music and life are always equal. I never intended to go into music. I was never one of these kids that had this kind of epiphany at the age of 14, like this is what I want to do. So when I was going to school, I was actually doing music and mathematics because they're things that I both enjoyed doing. And it was only kind of later on that I realized, wow, it would have been a really big choice to decide to not do music because I've been doing it since I was six. Um, so I don't want to say that I fell into it as a career, but it would have I would have had to make a really conscious decision to be like, I've been doing this since a six since I was a six year old, but now I'm going to choose to not do it and do something else permanently. And you know, I, I realized that it was just always part of me, and I was always going to be doing music in some fashion. And I think all the other stuff I was doing was a little bit the same. You know, I loved playing chamber music when I was a kid. I had a fantastic quartet with my older sister, who's six years older. And uh, two musicians named Carl and Joel Stoby, who are both quite active in the world these days. And, you know, they were both older. Carl was six years older than me and, of course, was like kicking my ass at everything. He was like amazing at the violin. And I wanted to do everything that he was doing. And it was so inspiring, right, to go and play in a quartet with, you know, this guy who was playing, you know, Glasnov concerto. And I was barely playing Bach double and to have that inspiration and think, wow, if, if I keep working, I can play like him. Um, but also just the communal aspect of of doing chamber music, of getting to do recitals, of, you know, even traveling, of going to kind of local places around Prince George, do a little recital. This was stuff that I had always done my entire life. Yeah. Um, and it's true. There's more opportunities as a violinist to do chamber music, to do uh, quartets and recitals than there is for any really any other orchestra instrument. Um, there's just more repertoire for us. Um, I would say the trade-off in an orchestra is that 
if you're a violinist, you're playing in almost every single piece that's ever written. You know, there's about five times in 20 years I've been off a piece in orchestra just because there's no violinists in it. Um, whereas a trombone player, there'll be entire weeks where you're like, good, they don't need me for this. Beethoven too. I can go home and I can plan my other stuff around it. Um, logistics of scheduling is is a very interesting concept, right? Because I've been lucky enough to play in orchestras that really believe in what I'm doing on the outside and, and support me in that. But there's also the logistics of them being like, but we have a week where you have to be there, or perhaps we have a week that we don't know what we're doing yet. So we need you to hold that week for us and you can't book other things. Um, so I would say it's a real kind of like jigsaw puzzle, fitting it all together, finding out, okay, what's the orchestra schedule going to be like? How am I going to fit in my other things? What series are booking that can wait for my schedule so that I can commit to them? Because I have had a few times where I've agreed to concerts on the outside, but then the orchestra has come back and said, sorry, we're doing Scheherazade that week now and you have to be there. No discussion about it, which is totally understandable because at the end of the day, my job is to to do all the big solos for the major rep and an orchestra and this sort of thing. But it does mean that there's this kind of like, kind of this game of trying to fit things in and making sure that the scheduling works out and that can be complicated. And I think for sure, a lot of people get frustrated by that um, because it's hard to schedule and you don't always have control over exactly what you're doing. Uh, with that whole two for someone in, in the second section, third row. I think every orchestra is different. I would say that as concertmaster, I have a little bit more um, upfront knowledge over what the major pieces that I have to be there are going to be. Um, but I probably have a little bit less flexibility in what I can miss in that if it is a major recording or a major week with the music director or a major Einheldenleben or something, it's not really an option for me to say, oh, can I have this week off to do something else? They'd kind of be like, well, no, of, of course you can't. You have to be there. Um, every orchestra is different, right? When you audition for some orchestras, they will tell you up front, this is your job. We don't do time off for other things. Chicago Symphony, for example, will say straight up to you, this is your job. This is not an orchestra where we have people that are doing all kinds of things on the outside. They feel pride in themselves as the Chicago Symphony, but in a way they require that everybody be there for basically everything. Um, you know, I would say the Canadian orchestras are more flexible in that way, partially because we just don't have 52 week seasons. You know, Toronto is a 43 week season, Montreal is 46. So that means there are, there's more kind of flexible weeks in there where you just don't have any orchestra services that you can use for other things. But I, I think they also realize that it's a little bit of a different situation Chicago Symphony pays, you know, tons and tons of money. And in, in return for that, in a way, you're saying, yes, this is by far my most important job. And this is what I'm really dedicating my life to. The Canadian orchestras obviously don't have the same funding models. The philanthropy is different here and they don't have the same, you know, base salaries in US dollars. But I would say that they are more understanding in my experience, at least of people that want to do that and also enjoy doing other things on the outside to keep to keep their minds going, to keep nimble, to keep great at chamber music and to keep those skills up. How important do you feel, um, and, and Noah popped up a question, which I'll, I'll, we will definitely talk about, um, but how important do you feel as a concert master is sort of the, the, the liaison between music director and your, and your band? Uh, do you feel it is for your members to to do chamber activities, to to be involved in other type of artistic uh, ventures outside of the uh, orchestral world. Yeah, I think it's deeply important. And I think an orchestra that's full of people that are fulfilled and happy is going to sound better than one where you're taking away opportunities from people. At the end of the day, an orchestra that has its finest players there will also sound great, right? So there's a balance and it's every music director has their own way of finding a balance about having you know the the regular members of the orchestra there for really important things but also giving flexibility for them to do other stuff i know peter unjin my former music director was always incredibly supportive of of principal players and regular members of the orchestra doing things on the outside that would make them better human beings make them better musicians make them happier in their careers so he was actually incredibly generous to many members of the orchestra even for major tours or recordings if they had something else that was really fulfilling to them, he would let them go do it because he 
at the end of the day, wanted people on stage that really wanted to be there and were coming back in a great frame of mind. Uh, let's uh, answer Noah's question. And, and ironically, uh, I think both of us can answer this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, I'm fortunate to to work with uh, Jonathan on a on a very small part of his artistic offerings, uh, as many of you know. In addition to his role as concertmaster with Toronto Symphony, uh, he is with the new Orford String Quartet and with a wonderful pianist from Montreal, Philip Chu. We have the Crow Chu duo. Um, how often have you had to turn down recite opportunities? Um, uh, I'll let you start and and I'll support. Yeah, I mean, regularly. And I would say there's probably more things that I just don't even hear about because, for example, Andrew will just say like, yeah, I know he's got a, a concert week that he can't miss for the TSO or something and just kind of move on. But yeah, definitely there's a lot of times where something amazing will come up that I can't do. And, you know, 20 years ago that really, I was like, oh, I'm so frustrated. I really wanted to do this. And then, you know, as time goes by, you realize, okay, opportunities come back and things will come up again. And, you know, the same people that ask me for something, maybe they'll say, okay, well, look, can you do it next year? Do you have any flexibility? And at the end of the day, many things kind of work themselves out. Um, and like Andrew can explain more than me, the jigsaw puzzle of putting together a kind of schedule of a year in somebody's career for, you know, between the performance venue, between the performer's schedule, it's really complicated. Um, but yeah, there's certainly been a handful of things that I've missed that I would have loved to be able to do. But it was always doing something else at work that I was also really happy to be able to do, like a major, a major recording with a great orchestra or some sort of incredible uh, event or tour that I was, you know, proud to be part of. And one thing that uh, in our administrative talk after after you leave. Uh, this being our last one, I, I call it my three pillars of, of artistic mm -hmm. success. And, uh, and one of them is, is the administrative readiness. One thing that I can share with everyone listening is with Jonathan, I am so blessed to work with uh, people of his artistic caliber, but Jonathan will never not reply to an email. He, he throughout his schedule, Sometimes the only reason why he doesn't reply within the two hours is because he's in rehearsal and he can't get to his his iPhone or or his his Android. Um, and then this leads, you know, this leads to other questions of mine. Uh, Jonathan is is also the artistic director, which uh, has a huge amount of administrative duties. Um, he mentioned this festival in Toronto called the Toronto Summer Music Festival. Um, you're the artistic director there, but how much administrative duties, uh, let's break down your jobs, uh, do right. you have with the symphony first? Okay. So, I mean, the symphony, in an interesting way, I have much more kind of administrative consulting duties than I ever would have expected. Um, and that's because I think when I joined the symphony, in the space of the first nine years, I think I was on four or five CEO searches, which was not something that I expected. Um, you know, we had an amazing CEO when I joined of Andrew Shaw, who left shortly after. And at that point, it became kind of there was like, you know, a sliding doors of trying to go through different people and people who pulled out of the process and having to restart until we finally reached Matthew Loden, our wonderful president who we have now. Um, but it took a while to get there. And that was a real learning curve for me because I hadn't had any experience in the kind of businessy side of things, you know, like with headhunting firms and putting together, you know, job profiles and this sort of stuff. They're like, what are you looking for? And I was like, I don't know, somebody who's really awesome at raising money, I guess. I mean, that was kind of as far as I could go. I was like, well, yeah, just get somebody who's really good. Right. Um, and so that's been eye opening how much administrative stuff is involved in that way. Um, I'm the representative of the musicians to the board. So I deal with kind of connections between the musicians and the board, which has been, actually that's been really wonderful because we have a great board and an amazing board chair. Um, but no, I didn't do any of this stuff in Montreal at all. And in Toronto, it's much more. Um, so that's been really fun. And then of course we had a, a recent music director search, which was quite lengthy and exhaustive. We went through a lot of different people. We went through a, to a lot of different towns to look at different conductors conducting different orchestras. 
Um, so again, really fun, but eye-opening, the kind of process that you go through to narrow people down, you know, going from a list of 100 people and how you get from there to one person. It takes a while and there's a lot of documents and there's a lot of meetings and there's a lot of discussions, a lot of kind of litmus tests to figure out, okay, how do we really decide who's gonna fit the profile perfectly? And at the end of the day, you hope you get the right person. So that's been busy. Um, Toronto Summer Music. So we have an amazing admin team there. So I don't deal with basically anything logistically, which is incredible. So I'm never dealing with venues. I'm never dealing with contracts. I'm never dealing with actually working out you know, how do we get in the venue? What time can we get there? What time is the rehearsal going to end? Um, and I don't have to deal very much with scheduling because we have an amazing artistic coordinator who's like can schedule anything and is never makes mistakes. She's great. Um, I deal 100% with the artistic stuff, with booking age, uh, booking artists, with booking repertoire, um, putting together the theme and kind of the overarching how the repertoire fits in with the theme dealing with agents to see what their artists might want to play to see whether that fits in with our theme you know um dealing with replacement artists if somebody has to cancel through illness or that sort of thing um and i would say i could never have done any of this even 10 years ago because much of what i do i can get done on a four-hour plane flight you know if i'm on a, a plane flight from toronto to vancouver and i've got my computer i can get hundreds of emails done and contact lots of people and deal with lots and lots of stuff um, and then as I land, it all comes back to my phone and I can, I can take care of a lot of things when I'm offline, which is incredible. Back in the day when it was nine to five, having to call people, I don't think I could have done the things that I do right now just because I would be in a rehearsal. I can't take a phone call and it's often I wouldn't have time to kind of like phone somebody back at break. There's just not enough hours in the day unless you can use all that extra time. Um, going back to the the Toronto Symphony position of, of administrative duty. Uh, earlier in our guest, we had uh, a staff member of the TSO, Allison mm -hmm. Benz. Um, Allison is, is associate personnel manager. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and she often, she talked about various committees that, that, uh, that exist within the Toronto Symphony. And last week we had uh, Andrea Davidson who mm -hmm in three different type of size orchestras and and, right. and obviously everything is size dependent um uh, regina symphony would not have as many committees as toronto symphony simply because of budget and size um what are some of those administrative duties what are some of those responsibilities i think often students and you would know this better than myself i was not a, a orchestral instrument background um, most kids probably think as long as I practice my excerpts and practice the or orchestra pieces, I land a job and that's all I need to do. And right. clearly both you and I smile at these statements. Yeah. Can you share a day in a life in that sense? Yeah, for sure. And I would say like, you know, things, even since I, I won my first job about 20 years ago, um, almost 25 years ago, I would say even since then, things have changed dramatically. When I auditioned for the associate principal second violin at OSM, I think there was 16 people who applied. Um, and now there would be 70 people who would show up for something like this. And in the States for an equivalent position, there'd be 200 or 300. Um, and it's just insane. And of those 200, 100 are gonna play really well and 50 are gonna be spectacular and 25 are gonna have great days and one person is gonna get the job. So without wanting to be depressing about it, it's very hard to win one of these jobs. But at the same time, I would say that there's a lot of other things going on now that we never even thought about, you know, music therapy and, you know, music and digital stuff that we're all doing right now. And so you have to be kind of good at more things, I would say now. And, you know, we're as we go through contractual agreements and stuff with the, the TSO and we, as we look at what's happening in the States, we're always looking as musicians to see, OK, is our audition process great? Is it the best thing? Is it the best thing to hire somebody blindly behind a screen who might play amazingly well, but if they're talking to a donor, it's not going to work out. Or if they need to go and talk to a board member or to an audience member, they can't make that connection. Or perhaps do we need to have people that have creative ideas about programming so that musicians can contribute more to programming and, and this sort of thing. And I don't know where these things are going, but certainly when I look at the new people coming into our orchestra, they tend to be people, one, who play really well, but also have lots and lots of ideas about what they want to do. They want to be able to relate to their audiences. They want to be able to connect to Toronto in a way that goes beyond 
playing Mahler five on stage, but, but perhaps being able to take some Mahler to a group of people who have never come to the symphony either because they didn't want to, or because they didn't have access to it, or they just were never, never given the kind of, never gave it a thought that maybe I would like this, you know, there's a lot going on. Um, and so right now there's a lot of different stuff going on at the TSO and I'm a member of some of these committees. There's an orchestra committee and that one deals mainly with logistics of rehearsals, of making sure that everything is run according to the agreements and, and dealing with right now they're in negotiations because we're, we're at the end of our contractual agreement right now and looking for a new one for September. Um, more kind of like artistically, there's an artistic advisory committee, which I'm part of. And this is a huge thing because now we are looking at, normally we look at the season and we think, okay, what do the musicians want to do? What do we have to comment about the conductors that we're getting? What do we think about the programs and how they're spaced? And, and really looking at the kind of artistic stuff of day-to-day -day orchestra life. Um, right now, this has dramatically changed because we're all kind of trying to think, well, what can an orchestra do for the next couple of years? In September, can we do orchestra concerts at Roy Thompson Hall? Are we going to be able to allow to have at least, you know, 1,500 people or so at Roy Thompson Hall? Because that's what it, what we kind of need to have to, for it to make sense to do concerts. Or do we need to look at vastly different ways of reaching people? Do we need to look at smaller concerts? Do we need to look at chamber music? Do we need to look at online educational activities? Right? So this has taken a lot of time recently and will continue to take a lot of time for the next year and a half, I would say, at least until things go back to normal or there's a vaccine or, or the virus dies out. Um, we have an education committee that deals with, okay, how, how can we as orchestra musicians reach out not just to young musicians that are playing the violin or the flute, or, but basically to every kid in school and how can we kind of find things that are meaningful for them? You know, TSO just put up a new series of education videos and it has orchestra musicians teaching you how to make an instrument and then playing that with their kids and stuff, which is super fun, right? And it's finding ways to go beyond like practicing the flute or practicing the violin, but how can we interact with people in a way that inspires them to love what we do, to show them that we love what we do? And how do we reach people that maybe have no concept even what a Beethoven or a Mahler symphony is? And that can be that can be difficult because it's definitely not something that I ever learned at school. And I would say education is getting much better at this. And Andrew, and you're part of it. You have courses where you talk about the career, but going through my schooling, I had very little that wasn't just like, here's your orchestra, here's your theory, here's your arts and science elective. Okay, now go into the world and good luck. Right? So it's, you know, education of is definitely changing, but I would say that a musician these days needs to be more than just really good at playing Tchaikovsky concerto. Um, a musician needs to be more creative, they need to be more thoughtful, they need to be more understanding of the business side of things. They need to be more understanding of the, the human side of things, because at the end of the day, we're all dealing with people. And Allison, who was here, I guess you said last week, you know, she's in personnel, which means that she has to deal with people on a regular basis, not just faceless people, but actual human beings who might come in and need some help about something that has very little to do with actually playing the violin, but has to do with interactions with other people and this sort of thing. And, and it's interesting you say that because Allison is one of those whose uh, academic uh, pursuits included being with one of the guru teachers of the timpani, Tom yeah. Freer in, in Cleveland. And, and here you are mentioning, you know, and then Allison also talked about this, the, the switch over to administrative life. Um, and I am going to ask sort of a, a, a wrap up question. Uh, thank you for, for spending all this time. What advice would you give orchestral players? And, and before you answer that, I, um, I'm i very grateful that you mentioned how it's more than just playing the Tchaikovsky D major or, or, or the Tchaikovsky Rococo or, or, uh, the, or the Mozart Fluid Concerto. It's, it's the career today, and, and I'm not sure, if, I think his name was Mateen. Uh, last week, uh, just as we were wrapping up, popped a question that I wanted to ask, which was, uh, what what are the main obstacles in the path of a classical musician's pursuit towards financial stability? Mm -hmm. You know, you dropped, literally dropped that as we were wrapping up, and I said, please save it for, uh, I'll, I'll answer that today. And wow. hopefully one of the main messages uh, that, uh, that, uh, the students today have heard from both you and my past guests is the importance of diversity yeah. 
importance of of diversity of knowledge, diversity of, of skill sets, diversity of interest, and how definitely I've, I've been around Toronto, not actively with the symphony, but in, in, in knowledge of the culture of the symphony, and have seen that switch over where uh, there was a time when when players were very possessive, the, the institution was very possessive about their players, unless you got a solo with you know Chicago or New York film, right. you're not allowed out of your contract, and we're not going to tell you, you know, until August fifteenth what your next year's schedule, you know, which yeah. we, you know, and and we see how the culture of the organization has changed and the involvement factor and, you know, corporate America, corporate Canada has talked about buy, you know, staff buy-in, you know, staff employee shareholders, uh, dividends yeah. and things like that. And we're finally moving that culture into the cultural arena. So what advice can you give to all these young aspiring musicians of the NYO? Uh, it's a great question. You know, I, I would say, don't think that anybody owes you anything. And this comes kind of from my experience in an orchestra where I would say there's there's a little bit of a problem that too many people think that because we play great, amazing music, that society owes us and that we need to be able to keep doing that because we play great, amazing music. Now, I think it's kind of a given that Beethoven, Mahler, Mozart, Brahms, that this is wonderful music and that it's worthy of something. But at the end of the day, an orchestra is, is partially an artistic organization and it's par partially a philanthropic organization. We can't exist without one really generous donors and without governments supporting us. So we can't go to those donors and say, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna play Beethoven symphonies and it's gonna be for an audience which is quite wealthy that can afford to pay for tickets but they, can't, they won't pay enough to actually fund the orchestra. So can you please give us a whole bunch more money so we can keep doing it? At the end of the day, if we don't contribute to society in a way that reaches all of society more than a very, very privileged segment of society, why, are we, why should we expect governments or donors to help us out? They don't owe us anything. We love what we do. And our job is to be able to convince as many people as possible the value of it and how much we love it. If you can reach anybody with Beethoven, they just generally tend to love it. But if you don't make the effort to go to them and to try to make your music relevant to them, they're never gonna kind of just come to us. So don't expect that anybody owes you a living playing music. Instead, fi instead find a way that your music is of such value to the community and to society that people will support you with it. And it's, it's kind of a different way of looking at it. It's not because we play Beethoven, it's because we are so valued to society and to so many people that governments can't possibly cut it because they'd be like, no, you're doing something which is incredible and useful and not just kind of a kind of elitist small segment of the world. And it's so true, definitely in, in a city like Toronto and for those of us who are in this room, sure, we, we can't imagine what life would be like without Beethoven and Brahms and Mahler. But we are a very small percent. I personally yeah. use the term 11% uh, of people on the street care about classical music. Here in a city like Toronto, um, we have a huge population of, of uh, refugees and, and, and immigrants who, who, you know, I, I often use this example in my class students in this room might have heard of Peking Opera. Right. And it probably sounds absolutely foreign and to a point almost disgusting. <laughs> this is music that was around a lot longer than being. Yeah. So for us to play music to foreigners in that sense is equally foreign. Yeah. So we can't expect that just because you're born and you grow up in Canada, you're going to be a flag waving lover of classical music. Yeah. And it, wonderful words, engagement and, and relevance. And then we use that term performance engagement. But the term engagement, if you look at that root word, roots of that word engage, is to cause reaction uh, between two people. Right now, we're just sort of giving yeah. and expecting someone to passively sit and accept. Yeah. 
So, so thank you. Fantastic information. Any questions? Uh, I've chewed up more time than expected. I apologize, Jonathan, but uh, to the room. Oh, my fault. <laughs> uh, any questions that you would like to your, your opportunity to reach out to uh, the, the only person in this country that sat in both of the largest orchestras first years? <laughs> I covered everything. You have given them the key to <laughs> orchestral success. <laughs> okay. Going once, going twice. Anyone? Okay. Well, thank you, Jonathan Crow, for sharing your wisdom, your experience, your insights. Uh, I hope that uh, those who are in the room listening. Uh, have a better understanding of the of the career and the activities. Um, I think so many, uh, because as you say, 25 years ago, there might have been 15 people auditioning. And today that yeah. same position in a major orchestra would have 100, 150, 200. Uh, in answer to Mateen's question, the importance of diversity. And, and I know for sure, um, in my experience with with dealing with you, uh, that we can talk everything from orchestral repertoire to vocal repertoire to court, obviously chamber uh, repertoire and and solo repertoire at that. And I continue to stress that working with you and, and Phil, um, for those listening, as a manager, as an agent, I need information and product. The name Jonathan Crow and Phil Chu are well known to you in this room, but as far as ticket selling power, uh, it it's strong in some places and weaker in others. And so we need a program. And I know that with Jonathan and, and Phil, when I have to work with them, that normally within a day, we design a program. And when I say something to the effect, guys, it's a little bit too heavy or a little bit too academic you guys always come back and, and say can we do this can we do that and and it's um it's, it's an absolute privilege to work with artists of your caliber who understand the marketplace um and and who work together in bringing in uh so uh noah had a question which community outreach strategies do you use that had had most promising results Hmm, that's a great question. Um, it, it's it's a yeah a longer one than we have for this, but I think th the main thing is that you have to you have to ask the community what they want from you. You can't tell them what you want to give them. Um, for example, like I'll use I I go to the jails and I played four concerts in jails between minimum to maximum security. Some of them are really maximum security with you know guards with machine guns up in, on a second floor, and some of them are are much more relaxed. And it's interesting thing, I thought I was gonna go to the jail and I thought I was gonna play for them and they're gonna be like, wow, classical music, that's the most amazing thing, Vivaldi, I love it, I've learned so much from listening. No, they wanted to tell me about their reactions to it and that was the most important thing to them, was to hear this great music, but then have the chance to talk about how it made them feel and their reaction to this music and then I kind of realized later, they just, they wanted to be listened to as human beings. These are men and women that are in jail, that nobody listens to them. They are shut away from society and they don't have interactions that I would just take for granted. So they didn't want another person that was just coming in, giving them a show and leaving. They wanted somebody that was to go in and listen to how, how it worked and listen to what, what they thought about it. And that was almost the most important thing to them. I realized it didn't matter so much what I played but what mattered was the emotion that it elicited amongst them, amongst the inmates and how, how they felt about it, right? So that was kind of an example where it changed. I thought I was offering them something. And what I realized it was actually kind of them offering me something that was the most successful thing. So don't go to a community and dictate what you can offer them. Try to figure out what, what is the most useful thing that they want from you, what you can learn from them as well. Um, David Roberts, would you encourage students now to take professional auditions with only a bachelor's degree? Um, I would encourage students to take any auditions that you have taken seriously and that you're incredibly prepared for. Don't go and sight read auditions and do it badly because it'll turn into a bad experience and you'll think, well, why did I do that? Now I hate auditions. But 
any audition that you are prepared for, that you feel great about, that you can go in and you can learn from your own experience what it's going to be like, how you're going to react on the day, that's great. Um, also, don't take auditions if you don't really actually want to take the job, because that will get you into all kinds of trouble later, right? If you're good and you might actually win it, take it, win it, take the job, but don't do it and then think, oh, I was just doing that for fun and now I actually don't want it because that will give you a very bad reputation. And and David, I'm not sure if you were uh, online when Allison mentioned that she belongs to an association of, of orchestral personnel managers uh, throughout North America and they have e-threads and organization <laughs> groups. So uh, it again, it's a very small world that uh, Good news travels slowly. Bad news travels very quickly, and uh, and you definitely don't want to be known as that kid who's just taking auditions for the fun of it, because yeah. as Jonathan said, he had to sit on various committees. I'm sure you had a violin posting that you obviously had to sit on, and and you've had X number of auditions over the over the past nine years, and this is time away from your family yeah. time and et cetera, et cetera. So. Um, and thank you about talking about that engagement uh, at at the uh, at the prisons. I, I know that's it was quite the initiative of Toronto Symphony, and and it's been extremely uh, fulfilling. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. And and use the term engagement again, right? Like yeah, in our day to day life, you buy something on Amazon, you're inundated with what your opinion is of both the process of buying and. Yeah. The when you finally receive it. And here we are in 2020 going to a concert format structure that has not changed since the day that Razumovsky, you know, paid Beethoven to write those quartets. Um, it's still show up, sit down, be quiet, don't say a thing, listen and get up and leave. Yeah. Society has changed. So uh, again, thank you so much for your insight. Um, and with that, you can either stay on and listen to sort of the Andrew Kwan uh, pillars of artistic career or continue figuring out your other artistic duties. <laughs> that might take a little bit too long. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Andrew. Nice to talk to you. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and this is our last little talk. Uh, that wraps up our session. Um, I've been often asked, um, uh, sorry about that, my office phone. Uh, I've been often asked what I feel I can, um, what I can share with young artists, what I can share about classical, uh, you know, the career path of musicians. I'm very fortunate that every day of my life for the past 29 years has been uh, dealing specifically with classical musicians, many of those are your teachers and people like like Cameron Crosman, who not that much older than many of you, and and people as established as Jonathan and definitely uh, the Griffin Trio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so hopefully, what I can share today will will help you guys maneuver. Again, there's no textbook in life. There's no uh, quick answer. Um, I'm glad it, it was not part of the script with Jonathan, uh, but as he said, you know, I can answer and deal with so many questions or, or reply to email on a four hour flight. And in my class to kids, I always say, you know, surfing, surfing Instagram or, or looking for another silly video of a, of a cat playing the piano is not going to develop your career. Uh, so Jonathan, as, as I say, is, is always amazing. Cameron is amazing. Um, I'm very fortunate to work with amazing people who are also administratively uh, respectful in the sense that they realize that is the machinery that allows you to perform. So why isn't this, where might classical music go from here? Um, this is sort of my wrap up conversation today. And, and I, I, I'm glad that again, Jonathan, I, I didn't think Jonathan was going to, uh, talk about that initiative of, of musicians playing in, in the prisons. Um, 
we often need to ask this question. We often need to, you know, we seem to be the only industry of this financial magnitude that doesn't truly care. And I know I a lot of people will take offense to my statements here, but that, that's okay. Uh, do we truly care who our audiences are? As, as Jonathan sort of said, instead of what can me, the great musician, offer you, what would you like? You know, if we thought about uh, any other industry, you know, if, if the auto industry didn't care that people were concerned about the cost of gasoline or that people were concerned about the environmental effects, we would all be driving, you know, huge cars. And there's obviously the question as to why you know, a, a single person needs these huge SUVs today. Uh, or if, or going back to the restaurant analogy, if a chef didn't care about the, 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 the customers coming into the restaurant and just cooked the way they wanted to cook, how successful would that restaurant be? Um, so who are the existing audiences? Who are the untapped and potential audiences? I often use this, and, and many of you can probably agree and, and realize it. How many times have we seen the concert description, come join us for a musical journey of works by, uh, of, of works by c such composers as Haydn, uh, Debussy, uh, Shostakovich? How many of us have seen concert descriptions like that? Yet we continue to always seek new audiences. How do new audiences know what a Haydn, what a Shostakovich, which means in this in this context? Um, and if that is the case, you've basically insulted your potential ticket buyer. If I said, "Come into my restaurant to serve you the best uh, osobuco." Um, yeah, for those who know what that is, it's 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 a it's a veal shank. Uh, Italians love making it, but but if you didn't know that, and it's a restaurant, you probably would already feel that the restaurant is pretentious and and it, that they're only seeking you know snobbery type clientele, which is not the way you want to enjoy your dinner. Yet we in classical music continue to put out concert descriptives in that sense, in that style. So we need to ask who are the untapped and potential audiences? And again, going back to the restaurant scenario that you go into an unknown restaurant, you are going to order something you are familiar with. If someone is not familiar with classical music, what piece in your instrumental genre is the common piece? Um, one of the things that, that, uh, um, I forget who asked about, uh, the, the outreach the successful outreach activity. Um, if we're going into elementary schools, what are the type of music kids are listening to today and how can we segue your instruments with ties to that? Uh, I know one of my groups, uh, uh, wonderful, ensemble, percussion ensemble, by the name of Torp Percussion on the quartet. They do 70 to 80 uh, elementary and high school uh, shows a year throughout the GTA. Around 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when, um, 10 years ago, when, when uh, Super Mario was much more common, they would use the marimba and start off bum, 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 ba -dum, bum, bum, you know, that, that opening theme and kids immediately related, oh, right, we play video games and there's music. That was their, their entry point into attracting audiences, not walking in there and sitting down and forcing kids to, to be quite a place of a Beethoven sonata. So how do we figure out who the untapped and potential audiences are today? And how do we make them feel welcome? How important is that? Every other aspect of, of you know, those of you who visit Toronto and, and have been to Toronto or live in Toronto, 
there are a number of very snooty uh, shops on Bloor Street that actually post a, a, a security guard at the door. How often do you run into that store to take a look? You don't. Um, how do we make people feel welcome? And, and what Jonathan said about his experience at prisons, how important is that? That it was the, the inmates need to share their experience of listening to music. You do it on Amazon, you do it on Uber, you do it in every, rate your driver, rate your, you know, rate your, your delivery man. Um, that being the case, what's our interaction with audiences? How do we make them feel welcome? How can we deepen their appreciation? No longer can we assume today that people know what a sonata form is. But at the same time, is that the most important thing about classical music is, oh, my next piece is a Beethoven sonata. A sonata form is an ABA. What exactly is that? that that's, that's academics. I'm more interested, you know, and, and, and I say this, that all of us have a, have a phone and I can learn more about the music history, the composer's biography and sonata form while you're playing that sonata sitting in your, your concert hall as an audience member. What can you share? What can you do? And the way that Jonathan mentioned that in this day and age, not only are people auditions uh, based on your artistic capability of playing your instruments, but your human skills, your, your, you know, can you talk to the board of directors? Can you talk to patrons? Can you talk to a donor? What can you do to talk to your audience? How can your concert experience deepen their appreciation? And I often say, none of you would ever walk out in a recital situation and sight read a, uh, a Brahms sonata for the first time. You have been training on your instrument since, in Jonathan's case, the age of six. Many of you probably started when you were eight or 10 years old. You have been immersed in the learning of your instruments. What makes you think that you can wing it to share information on stage verbally? If it takes you eight to 10 months, a year, a lifetime to perfect playing a piece of music, it should take you the same amount of time to practice what you're going to share verbally with your audience. Do not think, and I've seen it, seen this experience so many times that young artists go on stage and they're asked to say a few words and they figure, oh, I can do it. I can wing it. And they just absolutely die, you know, and, and we feel for them. They're uncomfortable. They're awkward. They don't know how, how to hold a microphone or they don't know how to project their voice. They're talking to the floor. Uh, so all of these things are so much more part of your development this day and age, uh, much more so than it was 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 80 years ago, when one classical music was part of the academic curriculum. Kids studied orchestra, kids studied music. Families all had a piano at home. Uh, families went to Sunday church where there was great music in the church. All of these things have eroded. So. People are new to listening to classical music. We need to deepen their experience. We need to, to ensure that they, they appreciate it. And how can our classical music art form, and, and what Jonathan said was fantastic in that classical music doesn't owe us anything. We have the privilege, and uh, without getting too political or harsh, there are still countries in this world where the music you're learning is censored and not allowed. There are countries in this world where half of the, 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 based on gender, listening to this conversation are not allowed to stand on a stage. Without getting there, we live in a very open cultural offering of a city. How do we ensure that classical music is part of the conversation? How do we ensure that it is uh, available? Um, you know, the, the, one of the interesting things uh, that I, I would never really think of, uh, but due to COVID, 
um, as, as the different stages are reopening society today, one of the areas that continue to pop up is no live music in restaurants. When would we ever agree to bring our music to where people are? We always expect bring people, you know, people will come to us. Why is it that we don't come to them? What are the things that will take to come to them? How can we ensure that people do listen? Because we realize that in this day and age, the old method of people assessing and acquiring the music is not uh, is, is not the same as it was 30 years ago. So what are we doing? What are you, the next generation, are doing to, uh, to continue the importance of classical music? So uh, this is sort of what I call my three pillars. First of all, many of you are in your early 20s, mid 20s, some of you are in your late teens even. It's a lifetime. I This is my 29th year as an artist manager. When I started, there were people who did not have email. Uh, the internet was just starting. The world continued, but it's. I still feel like I probably have another easily 30 years of doing what I do. It's a lifetime. I realize one of the things that I often hear with young artists is, is always, um, you know, you talk to somebody else and they they feel like they're they're you think you feel that the other person is always so busy because they're stressed and they've got so much to do, and you're sort of sitting there thinking, you know, what am I missing? Don't don't need to compete. Everyone is on their own you know, own course, own timeline. Um, and of course, what I what I put up here on the screen will determine a lot, a lot of how life deals its cards. It's a lifetime, meaning that these are what I call my three pillars. The artistic readiness, the administrative preparedness, the career endurance. What do I mean by these things? Artistic readiness. You have a lifetime to develop your unique voice. You have a lifetime to learn, continue learning, and and, and in doing so, um, have things ready in the sense that think about your recital programs, think about your orchestral programs, think about chamber repertoire, uh, think about designing programs. Don't just say, oh, you know, this, my school graduation recital requires that I do a, a Baroque, a classical, a impressionist, a contemporary. So therefore, my future programs are like that. Jonathan and, and Phil, unfortunately, the concert was canceled in Vancouver that we had, uh, but but it was a, it was designed on an experience of Jonathan's life. Uh, it was a tribute to Menuhin. Uh, when Jonathan was in Victoria, his one of I believe his first concerto performance with the Victoria Symphony was conducted by Menuhin. Um, so we, we had this program and we did the research as to what were some of the famous pieces that became Menuhin's signature. And you know it's 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 kind of nice, but I, I thank uh, whoever said people should know. Jonathan Crow, but the reality is that people don't necessarily know Jonathan Crow. He has been very much Eastern Canada, Toronto, Montreal centric for a while. And though, yes, he's a BC boy, uh, a lot of people don't know him. And so in addition to those who do already know him, we wanted to design a program that was inviting. People may not know Jonathan Crow, but you, you know, Menuhin, I do know that name. And then they look at the program. Oh, wow, those pieces. I know some of those pieces. Again, bringing more people. Uh, how do we engage more audiences? And this is a conversation that our industry desperately, desperately needs. And in this day and age of COVID-19 and the and the emergence of, of online uh, concert streaming, Classical musicians have fallen so far behind, um, and and in that, 
many of us have never developed or cared to develop because administrative stuff was always someone else's job. It's someone else's job to find me an audience. It's someone else's job to keep track of who those audiences are. It's not my job. I am the artiste and all I need to do is practice. BS. Times have changed. Uh, an indie singer songwriter, an indie folk group, an indie band, they want to capture who bought a ticket. They want to know how those people will follow them on Instagram, on Facebook, on, on whatever social media. Classical musicians don't care. They all they care about is, well, I want to play this piece of music. I don't care if you like it or not. I want to play it. How can this industry continue? And in that being the case, uh, moving on from artistic readiness, you guys, please be curious about repertoire. And, and that's what I was getting at with Jonathan, uh, about Jonathan, is that he doesn't just know about orchestral repertoire and violin concertos. He knows about what's interesting. You look at the past few years that he's been programming, Toronto Summer Music Festival. And Jonathan also has to know about jazz musicians and, and, and world musicians. Uh, because we can no longer continue to just offer this one segment of culture. Um, we can't just say that the only thing people want is classical music. The only thing we want is classical music, but we are a very small percentage. And even within the scope of classical musicians or people who love classical music, that segment breakdown is huge. There are people who who can who love classical music. Sorry, sorry. Uh, people who love classical music, but are diehard opera fans, and they would not know a, a violent recital happening in their town if it bit them in the butt. You cannot say those people are not classical music lovers. There are people who go to the symphony who don't know the first thing about a piano recital series in their town. There are chamber music subscribers who have never, well, I shouldn't say never, but who, who seldom would go to a symphony concert. So even within art, and then there's the early music versus the new music okay. segments. So we live in a very, very uh, compartmentalized within the definition of classical music we need to you need to figure out all the different angles in order to develop your programs develop your product develop your artistic product in a more interesting way as we continue to move forward in the in, in this in this uh, career path secondly the administrative preparedness sorry i'm here there is nothing that can happen in my office that you guys are not capable of doing. Two weeks ago, we talked about writing a biography. Write your biography. Have have a friend read it. Have all of these things available. Uh, definitely, it's my business to have all of these things. And two, three times a year, it's still an exhausting exercise. We read the artist's biography. We we have copywriters that, that we engage or, or there are times when we just update them ourselves. We keep things fresh. All of you should have your biography ready. All of you should have your publicity shots ready. Last week we talked about, and I apologize, I haven't put up those slides, that electronic press kit. Take this COVID period where we're physically not, you know, you guys aren't stuck in, in one of the uh, dormitories in, at uh, Wolfram Laurier uh, and take the time to, to deal with these things. Have it ready. And when the opportunities are there, you have that electronic press kit ready. This is the time which develop the list of people you have met. Develop the list of people who have hired you. When was the last time you got in contact with someone who actually wrote a check and hired you for a recital, for a, a chamber concert? You know, there, it's my job as a manager agent to be in contact with these people. Even during this COVID period, I have probably been on the phone uh, pretty much the same as before this period. Not because I'm selling to these concert presenters, uh, because I'm just staying in touch with them and seeing how they're handling their subscriptions, how they're handling, you know, just to make human contact. Um, how many of you get Amazon sending you, oh, the thing in your basket has 
has dropped in price or is soon to run out. Industry has done that for us. Why don't we do that? Why don't you do that for the career that you want to pursue? Um, what are some of the other things? De like I said, developing that database, um, getting in touch, understanding the marketplace, administrative preparedness. I, I love using this example that many of you go to the symphony in your in your town and you're reading the guest artist's biography, reading things. How many of you have flipped over to, um, take care Noah, nice to meet you. Um, how many of you have, have actually read who the administrative structure is of the orchestra? If you, I forget who it was that asked about, uh, as a pianist, how do you get involved? Do you know those these people? And, and these are part of the administrative preparedness as a young artist. Be curious as to how that concert series runs. Kerner Hall just announced their series. Who makes the artistic decision? Who makes the artistic decision at, at the Auto Chamber Music Festival or the Ritonello Festival, et cetera, et cetera? Um, sorry. Um, who... who so when you go to a concert, open up that that program and look for that page. Uh, who are the board members, et cetera, et cetera. And last but not least, career endurance. What can I share about that? Um, the longer you stick in it, the more people will get to know you. Uh, the longer you maintain your artistic excellence, people will get to know you. Uh, things didn't just happen. Um, and, and I apologize, and, and Roman Boris, uh, cellist of the Griffin Trio, artistic director of Ottawa Chamber, art, uh, and artistic director of the new Banff Classical Evolutions program, apologizes that he could not be on one of our sessions. But I remind John, uh, I remind people that uh, Roman and the Griffin Trio, when they first started 26 years ago, uh, uh, ran their own concert series because no one wanted to hire them. No one cared for piano trio. For every one piano trio, there's seven string quartets that get presented. Um, and back in those days, the joke was there was one piano trio in the world, the Bozart trio, and then everybody else. Uh, so that being the case, Roman said, hell with that. I'm, uh, we are good. We are emerging. No one wants to hire us. We will make people notice. And he risked and and rented concert halls and put on the Griffin Trio themselves. He would go into town beforehand. He, in Toronto, they had a three concert series at the Glenn Gould Studio. He would run around the universities and, and the grocery stores putting up posters. <sighs> yeah, you know, the Griffin Trio um, are not the Griffin Trio because they woke up and they played well. There are years of doing it. And those career endurance tips that I can share with you, time management, leadership management, uh, stress management, uh, issue resolutions, all of these things sound a little bit corporate, I'm sure, but you have to do it. You know, sh I'm sure that Jonathan would rather sit on the airplane from Toronto to Vancouver catching up on Deadpool 2, but instead he whips out his laptop and he's answering emails so that as soon as the computer gets connection again and he talks about um, how things possibly could happen today that it couldn't happen 20 years ago these days we even pay to to be able to send emails on an airplane uh, just because you're sitting on an airplane for four or five hours those are great opportunities to reply to emails and as i mentioned to you there is never an email that exceeds a day from Jonathan. If I email him a question, guarantee normally the same day he will reply. He will reply. And and he, look at all the jobs that he has. Look at all the titles that he has. Yet he will always reply to his emails. Do you always reply to your email? Do you check your email? I know for a fact that students that I teach, it's not always something common. Develop a system. Um, Yes, I, I know this is a little bit corny, um, but at least that's a start of a system. How many times, you know, I, I think I put this up about writing a biography. 
take the time instead of just casually quickly writing you know bio period in a bio dot doc but to save it as you know jane smith 2020 bio because that way in 2021 you can always pull out the 2020 and update that develop a system whether it's that excel file that you have in your computer called concert contacts or or conductor names etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, companies like mine we have to create these type of uh, databases ourselves because at the end of the day you can always improve on it i know it's a little bit cheesy but but this is all part of of your career path um think about i'm not sure why this slide should have been a little bit earlier my apology but as as far as the artistic readiness i'll put these up there um joint performance new commission in this day and age uh i think mateen as i mentioned had the question um what are the main obstacles in the path of classical musicians pursuit towards financial stability he asked this question last week all of you have probably heard of of uh the loblaws the national grocer chain called the real canadian superstore many of you probably have shopped in there well if you think about the genesis of 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 Loblaws, they were uh, well. Actually, the Weston Company were a bunch of bakers, and and they from there realized that okay, we can bake, make a product, and hope that someone will buy it from us, or we can develop the sales vehicle to sell it, called a grocery store. That was seventy years ago, eighty years ago, whatever it was. Today, you walk into your shopper's drug mart, which is owned by Loblaws Company. Or you go into Loblaws or, or or Real Canadian Superstore, and you buy some Joe Fresh. You you can do your banking there. You can pick up your medicine there. You can pick up wine and beer there, uh, and pick up your bread and butter. So hopefully, in answer to Mateen's question, financial stability, society requires that we multi-revenue stream. Think about the music teacher, the, the studio teacher you are studying with. If you're at U of T studying with Jonathan, he's concert master of the Toronto Symphony. He's artistic director of, of the, the Toronto Summer Music Festival. He's a member of the New Orford String Quartet. Uh, he gets recitals and concertos through my office, and he's teaching you. That's five paychecks that I count. That is the reality. Obviously, one has to then internalize it and, and ask the question, what is enough? You know, living in a city like Toronto is, is very expensive. And, and if you want a bit of a balance where you can go out to eat, you might have to do a few more jobs. Um, living in Vancouver, uh, living in Toronto, I think Toronto recently I read somewhere that your basic one bedroom apartment is $2,100 a month. So if, if 24, 20, uh, uh, $25,000 of your paycheck has to go into living, you need a few other jobs in order to have a bit of a life. So I guess an answer to Mateen's is, is the ability and going back to my, my little three ring, uh career endurance time management how important is that yes we can all fall victim to letting your netflix pop to the next episode and the next episode but sometimes we have to get off our asses and get to work um i've been criticized as an you know that that as a instructor as a lecturer that i'm a dream crusher uh that's i i'm such a pessimistic person that uh um that that's it's you know that it's not encouraging but my position is i'm not a dream crusher i just have to wake up and do it so that's that's perhaps something i can share with you guys um at the end remember evaluate yourself constantly keep that in mind evaluate yourself and and see where your strengths and your weaknesses are uh, yes, we are all facing challenges today, uh, but this threat and challenges, 
Um, right now, we're all equally behind the eight ball, so to speak, that, that we don't know when the halls are reopening. We don't know any of these things. But take this opportunity to learn about the technical aspects of our industry. Why I say that classical musicians have fallen so far behind is that in this COVID period, unlike a singer-songwriter who can put themselves up and do a online uh, video, uh, online concert uh, through Side Door, through Music Live, or any of these platforms available to monetize a show, we have no audience information. How many of you have a database of people who have followed you? Granted, you're a, a at a very early point in your career. So I'm not expecting that all of you guys have 10, 15,000 people following you. But one of the things I loved about Joyce DiDonato, beautiful singer and very savvy, during intermission of her concerts, she will shoot out performing at the music line or Staatsopera in one of the most gorgeous halls, you know, and, and shoot that out there. She's generating, she's taking that time to use the social media platforms, uh, understanding the threats and challenges. Classical music is not the only art form out there. We need to start to realize that. Being aware of other people's successes and failures are also very important. Uh, we often think that I play classical music and therefore, as Jonathan says, it owes me. No, that, that is not the case for any business. You may be the best chef in the world, no one's coming to your restaurant. You may be the best dentist in the world. And I love using this example as a dentist. Dent, you know, we always feel, oh, I've spent 10 years or 15 years, I've paid hundreds of thousands in, in, in going to, to Juilliard or to Curtis or wherever. And, and I've been, now I've got to pay for my instrument, blah, 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 blah. A dentist, equally, if you go to Boston University, and come home to, to Canada, you probably have a debt of around $200,000 from studying to be a dentist. And then to open a dental office, it will cost you anywhere from half a million to a million dollars, depending on the number of chairs you have. No one owes that dentist anything. Why do we feel that we play music, therefore they owe us? We need to look at these type of successes and failures look at other industries see community outreach community engagements yes you know the even how many of you have regular cable there was a time you pay for an ad during a tv show while well, all of you guys are watching uh subscription you know netflix crave hbo whatever it might be there's no more commercials in your shows the industry is changing. How are we messaging classical music, et cetera, et cetera. If our audiences are this more older audiences of society, they're not on Facebook. They're not on TikTok. They're not on, on, on Instagram. Well, if you want them to come to your concert, then you better make sure you continue to do a little postcard so that they can stick it on their fridge door. What are our strategies? Reviewing our strategies. Because at the end of the day, the purpose is to share the arts and it is an amazing industry that I hope this awful virus will soon subside and we can get back out uh, to play because there is nothing more amazing. Even after 29 years, when I sit at the back of the hall and watch my artists and know that through my dealings and interactions help create that opportunity for my artists to perform and connect with audiences. It's one of the most wonderful experiences and wonderful feelings that I can have serving my community, serving my artists, serving the audience. So I'd like to wrap it up there. Thank you. I know I ramble a lot. There's so much to share. Um, you can find me on the internet. Uh, you can find me at andrew at andrewquanartist.com. Feel free if one day you run into a question and you don't know who to ask, uh, just remind me that you're an NYO uh, alumni and, and we met through this virtual platform. I will be happy. My door is open for all emerging young artists. Um, so yeah, any questions?
thank you for those who who put comments off this ring doorbell that keeps popping up on my screen and sounds like I'm in some you know German submarine so Chris back to you all right Andrew well thank you so much for joining us over these past four weeks um, and all the great guests that you brought along with you um, I think not only have we really learned some tangible tools I think you gave us especially today all plenty of uh, food for thought so thank you again for being here with us, Andrew. Thank you.